My inheritance has cost me. The car and gadgets are nice. And I've almost gotten used to the smell in the cave. It's the criminals. Since my father died, they focused their attention on me. Hey man, somebody killed this lady. And the people around me. My father's enemies have gotten more twisted with age, more violent and suicidal. Crashing this train with no survivors. Because they know their inevitable end is near. They've seen Batman die. They've seen each other die. I can't believe they killed him. Yeah, man, things are getting really bad out here. The Riddler. This puzzle is far more than any mere game. Hmm? Dr. Death. You and I go way back, Batman. Two-Face. I still believe in Harvey Dent. All gone. Like the life I hoped for beyond this mask. Everything I have, everything I am, is because of him. I'm the Batman's daughter. I am the Huntress. And tonight, I'm hunting the man who destroyed my life. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Huntress Podcast. This is episode number 28. I'm Ashford, and along with me is Laurel. Hello, Laurel. Hello, Ashford. And we also have Diane. Welcome, Diane. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing? I'm doing quite well. So this is fun. Now, on this issue, the evens, we're going to talk about a Helena Wayne story, Earth 2 Adventures. And in this episode of the Huntress Podcast, brought to you by the Right On Network, we're going to talk about All Star Comics presents the legendary Justice Society of America, number 72. Um, But before we jump into that, we did get some feedback from the, the previous issue when we covered Helena Wayne who I'm just, I'm really digging. You know, I'm having a lot of fun and going back to this time period, comics in the late 70s, early 80s, fun stuff. But when we covered the Batman and family story, all right, Bat Family number 17, we did receive some feedback from Tim Price. And he wrote, the issue was amazing. Huntress got to meet practically the entire Earth One Bat Family in the single issue. I would have liked some of the scenes to play out a bit more like you guys did, but it was some good stuff as well. Hunter's giving Robin what for uh, meeting both her mother and almost mother. Huntress Batgirl definitely needed more time together, though, but also hard to picture Batgirl even visiting Earth 2. But such a fun issue. Unrelated to Huntress. The big lesson from this issue is that the JLA transporters are not following EPA guidelines regarding leakage into (laughs) mystical barriers. Dang, those things need better shielding. Thanks for the great discussion, gang. And, you know, thank you for writing in. Yeah, believe it or not, the Environmental Protection Agency actually started by Richard Nixon. So, hey, look, here's the deal, guys. Um, do like Tim did. He wrote to us on the website, the Huntress podcast.com. Um, that could really, you know, so you guys can jump in on the discussion because we want all the Huntress lovers out there for you all to flock under this one umbrella and continue discussions, especially about the particular issues that we, we talked about and those earth one, earth two crossovers, always fun stuff. And it doesn't just have to happen. At Thanksgiving. Now, Laurel, Diane, I'm looking at this cover. And when I look at this, I just think fun stuff. I think about even even before I started reading comics, this is what comics look like to me. Diane, what do you think about this cover? Well, the first thing that we see here is uh, the thorn uh, fighting Wildcat. And she's got him pinned to a wall. And we've got the JSA um, in the background. We've got Helena Wayne. Huntress, Power Girl, uh, Alan Scott, Green Lantern, and we got the uh, Flash, Jay Garrick. So they all they all seem to be coming to Wildcat's rescue, and we've got the Thorn literally saying on the cover, "Taste the poison of the Thorn, Wildcat, 
and die. So she's very much got him pinned to that wall there. So we don't know if Wildcat's uh, life is in peril, but we definitely, I'm definitely intrigued to see where this goes, actually. This is Joe Staten, right? I see his signature on here. Because we've been we've been covering this, I was just looking at it to see. If, um, I really like it. I think it focuses um, the way the buildings are. In, it gives you this like narrowing, so that things are going tighter and tighter as you go further back in the picture, which I really like that effect. Um, and I love that Thorn. Um, she looks wonderful, well developed. She's got some some nice abs, if I do say so. And uh, the way that Wildcat's pinned with just the, the costume being pinned is cool. Um, I love that the Justice Society is, like, appearing on the scene because we're, like, swooping in. Huntress has still got her cape flared behind her. So they're coming up on this scene. And, yeah, really a nice, nice cover. I think it's cool. And like Diane mentioned, just seeing this cover makes you excited about what's about to happen. And, like, ever since the past summer, summer of 2019... I've been, you know, Thorn and Rose have crossed my path in my personal reading, you know, a re- maybe something that's going to come up as far as her relations with Alan Scott. We read about her and some issues of Birds of Prey over on the Feathers and Foes podcast. And then when they were bringing back the Legion, she was like this, this watcher overseer through time. So, yeah. You know, it's kind of crazy how serendipitously, if I'm using the word correctly, um, how this character keeps popping up. But when you start globe trouting through the world of DC, reading present day in the past, the very past and present and back and forth, you will start bumping into some of these characters. So, Diane, could you uh, give us the honors, please? Yeah, definitely. I've got this. Um... So, All Star Comics number 72. Following their successful defeat of the Strike Force by the Huntress, Wildcat, and the Star Spangled Kid, the latter decides to leave the Justice Society in order to reclaim his family fortune as well as get his life back in order. In the kid's place, the Huntress joins the Justice Society as a new member. Sometime after the Huntress officially joins the Justice Society, a police officer by the name of Jack Riley is found murdered in Keystone City by his superior, his cause of death being poisoned by an old Flash enemy, the Thorn, the other identity of Rose Canton, who suffers from dissociative identity disorder. Just as the Justice Society are learning the details of Riley's murder, the Keystone City Police learn that the Thorn has made Judge Anders, the same one who sent her to prison, her next target. The Justice Society wastes no time to go look for her before it's too late for the old judge. While the Justice Society search for the Thorn, the team's chairman, Carter Hall, and his wife, Saira, are out excavating a location near the Nile River Valley in Egypt. While there, Carter tests his new mask that his wife designed for him, only to seemingly get abducted by a mysterious shadow person. Back in Keystone, the Justice Society managed to locate the Thorn and her gang at the courthouse, and though they put up a good fight, they failed to save the judge on time. Caught in the web of the Thorns' victims is Wildcat, who suffered a fatal poisoning from one of the villain's thorns. Wildcat is subsequently rushed to a hospital for immediate treatment. At the hospital, Wildcat's life is hanging on by a very thin thread, and the doctors will need to quickly come up with an antidote to save his life. To create one, however, they need to get a sample of the thorns' poison and the icicle's gun to reverse the brain damage Wildcat acquired from a previous fight with the villain. Green Lantern then sends a reluctant Huntress back to Gotham to retrieve the Icicle's gun from the JSA's trophy room at the headquarters while the rest of the team looks for the Thorn. Unbeknownst to the group, however, the Thorn is right there in their midst listening to their plans as the nurse, Rose Canton. Now aware of the JSA's plan to capture her, Rose reveals that during her treatment for her DID, She learned how to control both her identities by being able to summon them at will. Before changing back into the thorn, Rose decides to summon some help of her own. Specifically, she summons the sportsmaster and his wife, the more villainous huntress, Paula Brooks. Together with the sportsmaster, the thorn ambushes the Justice Society at the hospital, while the more villainous huntress 
targets and ambushes the more heroic huntress at the JSA headquarters in Gotham. And this concludes All-Star Comics number 72. Take it from here. And I love it. This one uh, is, is written by Paul Levitz. We have on the covers and inside the book, uh, penciler Joe Staten. Inker, we have Bob Layton. And columnist, Adrian Roy. Letters, we have Ben Oda. And editors, Joe Orlando. Laurel? Well, I was just going to say, um, Ashford, I'm curious, what was your overall impression of the book? Did you like it? I loved it. Like, uh, to me, I feel like this is a Christmas gift to the podcast because we get to cover Helena Wayne. We get to read a book by the creator, Paul Levitz. And uh, this came out June 1978. And it's, it's, it's a JSA book. And I, I, I love the fact that I like how they accepted her. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I feel like this is comic books. I felt like we received a gift with this particular issue to cover it on this episode. We got to read a story by the creator of The Huntress, Paul Levitz. And I love how uh, this is, I love how she was accepted, you know, mm-hmm. through her merit. But also it's like, hey, I know your daddy, you know, come on in. Yeah, of course you could be in the group. And it felt, um, it felt like this innocence that we don't have now. Uh, Mm -hmm. I I see some people trying to recapture it. I do see it in uh, The Metal Men. But uh, Laura, what were your thoughts? I mean, I'm sorry, Diane, what were your thoughts about this book? Uh, The overall, uh, this is actually one of my favorite stories um, in the Bronze Age JSA um, run because um, we we get not only a new member to be a part of the legacy of the Just Society, in this case, the Hunters, but we also get introduced to three classic villains in this story. We get the Rose Canton Thorn who has dissociative identity disorder. And we've got um, the sportsmaster and his wife, uh, the original golden age huntress who was a a flash villain. Or I think she was a flash villain. I may have to look that one up again. But yeah, I do like that we get three villains in this one story. And the Thorn by herself, she does a fine job at keeping the Just Society busy, but we also learn in the story that she actually um, she actually changed her methods from the 1940s, so she's not doing things quite the same way as before. And one of the major changes that we see with the Thorn in the story is that although she did receive treatment for her DID, you know, she did not actually, the doctors did not actually cure her two personalities so that it's only one personality what happened is there was that she learned to control both of the identities which is not something that a DID person can typically do so in this particular case Rose can control when she's going to become the thorn and when the thorn is going to become Rose again so I think that's really interesting I really love that about um, Rose Canton Um, and then we also see the sports master as well who is a very gimmicky style villain, but he's actually a fun villain that fits the tone and style of a JSA story. He very much fits the tone and style of DC's Golden Age. And then we've got, of course, my favorite thing about this story. We've got the Golden Age Huntress deciding to fight the Helena Wayne Huntress for the title of Huntress, which is basically going to be in uh, mostly the second part of the story. But overall, this is a great story. I I like the fact that they really focus on the thorn here and that she's, Really, she's really a bigger threat than she used to be, and that's kind of interesting what they do with her character here. But we also see that, you know, Helena Wayne, this is her first official outing with the Justice Society as a team. So before she was actually just working with three of its members, she was working with Wildcat, um, she was working with the Star Spangled Kid, and the Star Spangled Kid actually left in this, in the at the end of the last issue, and she basically takes his place here. So she's kind of new to this but we also know that she wants to be um treated as a valued member right away as evidenced by the fact that when alan scott sends her back to gotham to retrieve the icicles uh ray gun um she she's really cross <laughs> she's really well, cross about being sent back to yeah gotham, well, wait a minute let me know, ask you she, a question she, can, let me ask you a question there yeah. real quick because i'm curious um when she does get sent off like that Earlier, she was 
um, crying about her dad and Wildcat and she feels doomed. What has happened to her father? Where did that take place? Because I think that influences why Green Lantern is sending her. Well, that's kind of interesting that you bring that up because her father has not died yet it, at this point in her timeline. That happens much later in her timeline. But what did happen is that um, her mom died at least two years earlier and her father's in a state of grief. He, he, he's in a state of grief. He never quite recovered from that. So I, I think, I'm not sure if that's, you know, an error on Paul Levitt's part, if he meant to say that, you know, ever since her mom died, you know, she's been in this weird state where she just, as she said, I think she says in this that she feels like a magnet for disaster, not sure why she would blame herself for the deaths uh, that are happening around her. But actually, her mom was, her mom died like two years prior to the story. And her dad has been in a state of grief since then. And so he's been kind of a, you know, former shell of himself. You know, he just kind of withdrew after Selena Kyle died. You know, he hasn't really been, you know, interacting or very involved, you know, very much with other people in his life, especially herself and the JSA. So I think the way that I interpreted, the, I interpreted this one scene is that, you know, her father's, you know, kind of withdrawn. You know, he, he's not quite himself anymore. With the death of his mom, with the death of her mum, and she feels like you know between the loss of her mother and what that did to her father, you know she feels like you know things are not going right in her life at this time. And then we've got Wildcat, who is whom she recently met. She was the first he was the first person that she teamed up with, along with um, the Star Spangled Kid. Now his life is threatened, and so she's kind of feeling like you know every person that I interact with just seems to have bad things happen to them. And so I think that's why, you know, she's feeling the way that she does prior to the Green Lantern sending her back to Gotham. And then we see that she is really upset about that because it's like, wait, hold on. I know I'm new here, but I think I'm needed here more than I'm needed over there. Why would you send me off to Gotham like that? And she's very cross about that. She's very upset. You know, she feels like, you know, she's not being valued the way that she feels she should be valued. Yeah, well, I interpreted this a little bit different. Um, granted, now I didn't, I thought her dad might, might have been dead as well, and that was why she was, but when she falls apart a little bit here, I wondered if that influenced um, Alan Scott's plans here, because tactically it's not a good decision to send the Huntress back to their headquarters because she can't get back to them. She can't fly back to them. You know, it'll take her longer to retrieve the item and come back than it would be if one of the people himself or Power Girl went and retrieved the same thing. And I thought, is there a father figure thing, a generational gap, something like that happening here? Because, hey, the new girl is so upset. Maybe we should just send her and have her do this little task instead of having her stay and fight with us. That was the way I looked at it. Which, you know, maybe or maybe not that was fair or not. I don't I don't know. Ashford, what did you think about this since we're we're discussing this little scene here where she gets all emotional and is crying? You guys are looking at it logically. And like that's a very good point. Like, hey, she's not a speedster, so even if she finds it, how's she gonna be able to get back? I just looked at that straight plot wise because Actually, Diane recommended this story to me about two summers ago. I bought it in a trade. And I think it's all plotting. It's about, um, hey, earn your locker. Earn your locker. You know, like uh, Michael Jordan, he retired. He came back. It was a dude. I think it was Ron Harper. He had his locker and he was like, let's play one-on-one and I get to win it. That's what this is about because... I, I, I had no idea that there was a, a villain named the Huntress. So this was about, hey, you face this legacy that you're going to have to overcome, uh, rename, reshape. And so I, I'm just, I'm, I'm so steeped in that awesome sauce of it. You guys are making me look at this in a whole different way. Well, you must have liked when she did fight alongside the JSA, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean yes. she was a good member there at the beginning. I didn't. Uh, uh, well, I think I'm problematically looking at this as well, because, you know, as far like t to me, like like I like boring stuff, like like wonky stuff. 
So like when you're a detective, a lot of it's going to be unsexy. So it's like, why did Alan Scott send her there? What, what did they need to get? The icicles, uh, ray gun. Because the thing is that, so oh. what happened there is that um, Wildcat, he was poisoned by the thorn, but the doctors are unable to do anything with him because on the one hand, um, he's got a brain injury. And then on the other hand, they don't have a sample of the um, thorn's poison to make an antidote with. Now, the weird thing about that is, is that if he's been poisoned, he's got the poison in his blood, so we're not just extracted from there. But we can discuss that, you know, later. Well, was, but <laughs> well, no, I was well, yeah. gonna say I, I think I'm looking at. Well, to me, I feel like her going to get that. That's just important as I, I didn't see that as being dismissive. I think like, dude, we need that. Like, we really do. Like, we need that. Yeah. So, but well, what I'm trying to get at is that um, with the icicles. Um, Ray gun. Okay, so in the pre- in a previous JSA story, you know when they fought that when they fought that particular villain, you know he acquired his brain injury be- through that gun through the icicles gun, and so they do have the gun in the trophy room in the JSA headquarters now for Helena Wayne. You know she. So it may not be Alan Scott's intention to make her feel devalued, but that's how she's feeling as the new girl on the block. So. She's kind of, you know, seeing it, she's kind of taking it the wrong way. So I think it's going back to something that Laurel said. I think it goes back to the whole generational thing, you know. So Alan Scott's got one way of seeing things. He's much older. He's about, what, 40 years older at this point. And then we've got um, Helen Wayne, who's barely 20 in this story. So she hasn't even, she's just barely getting started. So we've got, you know, Alan Scott who knows what he's doing. And then we've got Helena Wayne who's just getting started. And she's like, what are you doing? Why are you sending me over to Gotham? You know, do you not think that, you know, I deserve to be here? So she's kind of interpreting that kind of the same way that a young person would in that situation. So I think they're just kind of showing their ages there. You know, Alan Scott doesn't see a problem you know, he's, you know, kind of saying, well, you're a member for the JSA now, but you know what, go and fetch the gun for us and then we'll look for the thorn. Yeah, um, it's who's... weird because I don't know if you know, you know, in the, in the beginning, she's alongside him. I don't know what page this is, page six, when the, the JSA um, initially find the thorn and take him on before Wildcat got hurt. And she's right beside him on, she's taking on the other characters. I mean, she... She's good here. I don't. I, it's just that emotional breakdown that bothered me. I don't know about you, but I thought she was really strong in this fight. Yeah, so she was definitely, you know, fighting the Thorns thugs in this one. And um, yeah, she held her own perfectly fine here. But I think that Alan Scott, you know, I don't think it's so much the fact that he doesn't think that she's got what it takes to fight the Thorn because they, re- they did kind of fight her very early on. But it's more of we need to send someone to get the trophy and he just happened to pick the huntress without really thinking about it Mm -hmm. even though even though it would have made more sense for like the flash to go and get it or power girl to go and get it or you know alan himself you know dr fate and uh hawkman are not really there because they are busy with something else they both got abducted by a shadow person that we'll learn about in 74 but yeah i think i don't think he was really thinking about that he was just okay we need someone to go get the gun huntress gotham's your home go get it for us Mm-hmm. That and, and 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 also we get more out of Huntress because she didn't appreciate that. So now I know that she didn't appreciate that. And like what type of character she is where, you know, she respects rank, but she also like, I want to be in the fight. So now I know that she is a, I want to be in the fight character. Yeah, yep. she definitely, uh, she definitely has, you know, a very strong personality as you can tell. She's, you know, She's very confident in her abilities and she wants to feel like, you know, the other members actually recognize that about her as well. I you think that, she, wait a minute, I, I do have a, I want to, uh, about, uh, you know, the confidence her and abilities and she does, but she is kind of scrambling here at the end with the death traps that have been set up throughout the JSA. And she says, um, uh, every inch of headquarters has been filled with traps, things I can't avoid. And even though I know who is behind it, I can't understand why. And then we're introduced, you know, to the, the I, do you call her the Golden Age Huntress? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know her real name. Paula Brooks? Yes. Um, when, when she's introduced, and then it's like, oh, okay, you know, Huntress on Huntress. Um, but that hesitation there at the beginning, you know, I was like, well, 
you know, at the, at the beginning of the issue, she was like on top of everything. She's upset. Then she's angry that she's being sent away because, yeah, that's kind of like she feels like she's getting dissed there. And then we end up at the end when she's sort of like pinned down and not exactly sure, you know, what is she going to do next? So I'm wondering if, you know, yeah, we need a full story arc. Maybe next issue I'd like to I'd like to see her pick back up and show um, but she can handle this, so I'm going to be looking forward to that. But the end, this this cliffhanger made her seem like she was really trapped in a corner. Yeah, so it's kind of it's kind of weird how that's executed because she looks very. I, I think she was caught completely off guard because yeah, when we she see looks, her, you know, maybe scared or young or both. It, it was sort of shocked, maybe I don't know, it, but it was sort of a hesitating that I wasn't expecting after, you know, she was so angry with them that she thinks she can be worth something. And then we go to this picture where she's like, oh, dear Lord, maybe I am in over my head kind of feeling. And I don't know if that's just the art. Is it the the statements that she's saying? I'm not sure which one. And I'd like to see her get out of this next issue, I hope, which I'm assuming, you know, we're going to have more story arc there. I think but this the way is also this is left. Yeah. Well, I think this is also written to serial. So, like, I, I'm flipping through this now. Mm-hmm. This is written towards um, I am going to pick up that next book because I have to know. So it's written very cliffhangery, and also like she's disoriented. You know, I was in the middle of a SmackDown fight. The Dallas guy put me in a green bubble, and and I'm and I'm <laughs> mad about that. And then this whole place is booby trap. I didn't even think people could get in here. So I think she's just disoriented for a second. Mm-hmm. Diane? Yeah, I have to agree with Ashford here. I think that, you know, she was not expecting to run into the Golden Age Huntress, who is 40 years older than she is, you know, mm-hmm. walking in there. Can and you so, tell us more about that Huntress? Because I really don't know her. So the, the Golden Age Huntress, she's more of a trapper, if you can think of it that way. And that's something that she does bring up in this story. So her thing is that she captures the prey, literally. And she uses a variety of traps and a variety of weapons to do that. So she's a very different huntress from Helena Wayne, whereas Helena Wayne is more focused on, you know, capturing, you know, criminals. You know, the Paula Brooks huntress is the polar opposite of that. She captures, you know, superheroes or other people that, you know, are of interest to her for some reason. And she uses... A wide variety of traps to do that so she uses anything from she does a lot of ambushing that's kind of a thing so she ambushes and she attacks you know very mercilessly and that's something that we see here so the pool of brooks huntress she's mostly um seen with the sports master and in later continuities she even has a daughter with uh the sports master artemis croc who i think becomes another tigress and she, I think she was also um, a speedy at one point. Or she was definitely um, someone who shot arrows. I don't quite remember what her identity is. I'm not too strongly familiar with the door. But uh, with the Paula Brooks Huntress, she's definitely the trapping kind. She's not so much, you know, a hunter as much as she traps people. She captures them. And whatever she does with them, I guess it really depends on the villain. Or it really depends on the hero that she captures. But that's really her thing. She's more of a trapper. And so that's kind of what she's doing with Helena Wayne in this story. And so she's trying to prove a point. She's trying to prove that, you know, you know, well, I've been doing this longer than you have. I'm definitely more experienced at capturing the prey than you are. I deserve to the title of the Huntress more than you are. So she's kind of seeing um, Helena Wayne as something of a usurper of her identity, even though Helena Wayne uses her hunting skills in a very different capacity from Paula Brooks. You know, for example, Paula Brooks sometimes carries a crossbow, but that's not really her main weapon. It's not really her main thing. And then... Um, I'm curious, do Wayne. you think that Helena Wayne... Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's okay, you can go ahead and ask. Oh, okay, uh, I just was curious, um, because you, you know the history of Helena much better. Does she know when she called herself the Huntress, that this Huntress existed? Do you think she knew that? I don't think she did because the Golden Age Huntress never actually interacted with her dad or her mum. She was primarily a Just Society villain. And I think I think she was either a Flash villain or uh, a Wildcat villain. She was, she was a villain of one of those two characters. And she w- did not really interact with her dad or her mum. So they never really had any meaningful interaction with her. And the thing is that 
the Golden Age Batman was not really a member of the Just Society. He only teamed up with them like maybe once or twice on very uh, during the World War Two era. So he, Bruce Wayne was not very closely associated with the JSA and Selina Kyle even less so. So um, she probably was not even aware of the Polar Brooks Huntress because she was not very you know, close to the JSA prior to her joining the team. And the only person who was close to the JSA, you know, prior to her joining the team was Dick Grayson, Robin. So, yeah, she was probably not even aware that Paula Brooks existed or that there was another Huntress before she took on the name. She just thought of the fact that, you know, her mom died and she was thinking of the kind of legacy that her mom left behind, you know, what identity she took on how that was, you know, related to a dad's identity. You know, the thing about cats and bats is that they're both um, hunters. They're both predators. And so she came up with a name that honored both sides of that legacy. And that's how she became the hunter. She became the hunter to avenge her mom's death. And so she probably, it was probably very much a coincidence that she chose that name, completely unaware that there was already another huntress out there, but she was a more villainous person than she was. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, um, Ashford, I don't know about you, but I liked this art. It really just pulled me through. I knew where everybody was in these fights, you know, um, because especially in the, when they're trapped in the hospital hallway and who's getting whose way and who's protecting who. I just thought that was extremely well done. The facial d- expressions are great. What did you think? Joe Staten. I loved it. Uh, I feel like the art was appropriate for this type of team book. And like you said, narratively, it made a lot of sense. And I'm just a sucker for it. Like I love his power girl. I love his Ted Grant. To me, I feel like when, especially this era, I think this is where it's at. So like, I would like all the art from this era to be like this, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. How Diane, are you a fan like we are? Yeah, I definitely love um, Joe Staten's artwork in the 1970s. He's got a very classic yet modern feel to those characters. But he also has a very, he's got a very strong understanding of page and panel layout. He knows how to capture motion. His, um, the way that he draws the characters in action is very fluid. You know, they, they're not very static. They're very expressive. You know, he definitely has a good stat. It definitely has a good handle on body language and facial expression. You know, a lot of the times, you know, how the characters are written matches how they're drawn. So I really love uh, Joe Staten's work on the um, Bronze Age JSA. And of course, he prim- he's a primary artist for Helena Wayne's solo stories as well. So, yeah, I really love the fluidity with which he draws the characters and the way that he you know, captures each of the individual personalities through the body language and the facial expressions. So with Helena Wayne in particular, we see that she's very confident in the very beginning of the story. You know, she's excited to be there. She's excited to be, you know, um, a member of the Just Society and fighting alongside such a legendary team. And then we see her sent to Gotham and she's feeling very cross. So when she's inside that bubble, she's got it in her (laughs) face right there. How very upset she is you know she's annoyed she's kind of grumpy in that one panel where she's inside the bubble it looks kind of funny at the same time but you you, you, the point is captured the he gets Mm -hmm. the point across Mm -hmm. i I finally see her interact with the polar brooks hunter she's caught completely off guard it's like holy crap i did not expect this to happen i mean i'm still kind of processing everything that's happening right now so she's got like a lot of things going on in her mind, you know, she needs to save Wildcat, she wants to prove herself to the JSA, and suddenly we've got, you know, the Golden Age Huntress, you know, doing a pissing match over who should <laughs> truly have the Huntress name, and so she's like, I don't have time for this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I really love the artwork here, it's very dynamic and expressive, yeah? Diane's right about that, like, she hit it right on the head with the, it has a classic sense to it, but in a modern take mm-hmm. and the faces I'm, I'm looking at the dc app on my smarty phone page 15 it really looks like there's a face underneath that mask so they have like a domino mask or whatever for alan scott it doesn't look like oh i just painted something on but there's really nothing behind the mask it feels like that and then we see Sportsmaster, who i'm seeing in a lot i, I went and visited a friend last weekend and uh, we were watching teen titans go and they were talking about some creepy guy in the woods 
but he was dressed like an umpire. And I was like, was that really supposed to be Sportsmaster? But uh, my introduction to Sportsmaster was from the, uh, it was called Legends. And it was a, uh, it was a Justice League of America season two. And it was when they went to a different planet and it was implied that it was the JSA, but they didn't, they said the Justice Guild. And uh, they had a Sportsmaster version in that. And in Young Justice, I think the first season, but with this sports master here, it doesn't look like they just painted something on. It really looks like there's a face underneath that mask. Great art. Well, I thank you, Diane, for having us read this because this was a lot of fun. I have I really got a kick out of this. I like the JSA dynamic here. I like how the, the Huntress is having a story arc. She's not just, you know, plug in hero A here, you know. She's her own person, and so is everybody else. We've got, what a fun story this is. Yeah, and especially look, yeah, and I like how it ends, too, because we've got two major threats going on at the same time. We've got the JSA being pummeled by, you know, the Sportsmaster and the Thorn, so that's one cliffhanger. And then, of course, we've got the uh, Helena Wayne Huntress being ambushed by the more villainous Paula Brooks Huntress. And she, I like how it ends. She's like, I've been trapping your kind before you were born, and she's ready to take on that fight i forget the exact quote oh yeah she's like she's like you know i'm the real huntress and before i kill you you'll admit it and so she's kind of we've got helena wayne in the background they're looking at her like who the heck's this (laughs) 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 so yeah so we've got two major storylines going on there we've got helena wayne's you know sub arc and then we've got the jsa sub arc and and i'm just kind of excited to see what happens after this because you know it's just It's really bonkers what goes on there. Yeah. (laughs) Final thoughts, Laurel? Well, just like I said, I enjoyed this. It was a lot of fun. Um, I have not read this era very much. And I have to say, this definitely makes me want to go read the whole thing. Because I'm just really tickled with how this came across. And I'd be curious to see um, as we go forward, if we keep this kind of quality up. Oh, I'm loving this. Laurel, uh, Diane? Well, I think Laurel hit the nail on the head. You know, this is a very exciting story for the Huntress now that we finally have her integrated into the JSA and that cliffhanger, especially, we've got the, with the two cliffhangers with the JSA and Huntress, you know, I'm very excited to see where all of this goes um, with issue number 73 of All Star Comics, and which is the penultimate um, issue before we get to 74, which is the last issue of All Star before that gets cancelled. And then the rest of the JSA adventures continue in Adventure Comics um, number 461 through 466. And this is when they're going to de- they're going to um, dive deep into the Batman legacy on Earth 2. So that's much later. But definitely this was a great start for Helena Wayne as a JSA member. And I look forward to seeing what she does after this. I love it. Uh, I would love to interview or just ask questions of Joe Staden and Paul Levitz. I would like to know if when they created this Huntress character, did they know eventually that she would face the Golden Age Huntress and win over the name? Or did they call her the Huntress and then later someone went, hey, you know there's a Golden Age one. Okay, well let's plot it where she will face her. So I just think this is awesome. Uh, What do you folks out there think? You fellow Huntress lovers, write to us at the website, thehuntresspodcast.com. You can also contact us on Twitter at Huntress Podcast. And we are on Spotify. If you write in the Batgirl forward slash Huntress Podcast, you will find us because this also shares a feed with a feed with the Batgirl Cassandra Kane podcast. Uh, leave us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts, if you would. That would really help support the show. Get the word out there. Write us a review, if you will. That would be wonderful. So until next time, it has been Diane, Laurel, and myself, Ashford. Bye-bye.